We're now going to move on to a member of uh, the third party. Uh, which one of you would like? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you like to go back and forth with the minister? Yes, please. Okay. Go ahead. Minister, thanks for, for coming today. I know that uh, uh, the file uh, has uh, um, d definite challenges, particularly when it comes to um, matching the science and uh, trying to uh, reach certain outcomes, particularly for uh, species at risk and, and whatnot. I just wanted to uh, touch on, uh, you talked a little bit about the EcoFit and you said uh, $1 spend equals $1.30 saved uh, for Albertans. Uh, so how, how did you come to that number? Uh, that was in part of the technical analysis that underpinned uh, the energy efficiency uh, uh, panel's report that, uh, whose recommendations we accepted earlier, earlier this year. Right. So has is, is there been a, uh, I guess, an equation also for every dollar spent on government, how much does government save? Uh, that's on a, a sort of a project by project uh, uh, analysis, uh, and so, uh, uh, for example, some of the uh, 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 sort of uh, near term projects uh, with respect to government uh, infrastructure, or quasi, if you will, mush sector, or quasi government infrastructure, or hospitals, right. universities, right. that sort of thing. Um, uh, those uh, investments were made uh, essentially on, on uh, 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 projects that we knew in the short term would in fact reduce greenhouse gas emissions and save costs uh, and uh, that were readily available and, and uh, uh, essentially just required that small amount of, of uh, uh, bridging investment in order to right. Uh, not take the least efficient path, but yeah. the more efficient path. Yeah, so and I, th I think you said too, like with, uh, you know, uh, the retrofitting of homes, uh, that green initiative, you felt that that was low-lying fruit uh, in terms of uh, curbing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's right. Um, so how, how many, so in terms of low-lying fruit, from a government perspective, how many government buildings have been retrofitted to date? Uh, it, you know, the, we've uh, taken it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, uh, our approach has been that, uh, well, first of all, we already procure 100% uh, of our electricity uh, for the GOA uh, from wind. Uh, and so that's on a, uh, uh, that's been the case since 2006, so how's you guys? Uh, but, uh, so there's that piece. Put on the assembly chamber and there's all the wind you need. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that exists and, uh, and that is why um, we as a government took the position that just as the previous government uh, uh, essentially provided some certainty to wind uh, uh, developers in, uh, at that time through uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, an agreement with the government, we have now put out uh, a, a request for proposals uh, uh, to do the same as that contract turns itself over for utility scale solar right. uh, to examine what our options might be there and, and uh, the industry says it's competitive so right now we're in a process of testing that theory. Uh, and uh, uh, so um, that is something that already happens within government. Uh, certainly as new government infrastructure is, uh, is built, uh, solar and so on is, is examined as, uh, a, as an option. It's, it's right. not compatible with every piece of rooftop, rooftop real estate, but it can be with some. For example, I okay. know there is some at the so, Lethbridge Provincial So not government. all government buildings have been retrofitted? No, not at all. Okay. And, uh, and certainly, you know, other, in other jurisdictions, uh, uh, that is uh, something Something that is undertaken. I, I know I've, I've visited a number of different uh, places where they uh, 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 undertake that work, and I think uh, we have some uh, to do in our province. Uh, I, however, I also uh, I, I think we take the view that that we want to make sure that uh, we're investing in Albertans, in uh, 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 small uh, smaller scale. Uh, uh, projects in low-income housing and those kinds of, of, of projects whereby uh, you get potentially a larger GHG savings okay. uh, and you've got more distributed benefits across the province in terms of local contracting and, and so on. And that's been really important to us that okay. uh, as we make these, these investments that they're not just focused on you know, government buildings in Edmonton, uh, okay. that, uh, that, that we really yeah. put a premium on, on, on reaching Albertans and making life more affordable. Yeah, well, Minister, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, some of the good work that we did before uh, you guys came along. And I just, uh, to, I just wondered if you may want to clarify your statement on environment in terms of investment. You did mention that the previous government uh, did invest in wind. Uh, there were partnerships uh, with industry to see those initiatives through, particularly when they weren't, uh, you know, uh, there, was a, there, there wasn't much of a cost benefit back then. It was more expensive. 
uh, to own and operate those things. Uh, so if I, if I look back at the 2013-2014 uh, uh, budget for uh, environment, uh, it was $634 million and uh, your projected budget for 2016-17 is uh, uh, $576 million. So I just wondered if you wanted to maybe clarify that, you know, the previous government did fund appropriately, especially during the 13-14 floods. Uh, to make sure that we mitigated that. Well, the 1314 uh, uh, piece was, of course, uh, re did reflect some of that uh, 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 response to the Southern Alberta uh, floods. There's no question about that. I think what we find in environment is that in, in specific areas, you may have seen uh, some program reductions uh, that, uh, uh, you know, led to consequences. Uh, and. Uh, uh, that is certainly something that I have seen. It's not in every area, uh, but in, in some areas, and in particular in operations and in enforcement. Uh, uh, those are areas where I, I think that uh, uh, we can do better. And, uh, and so that's uh, what we've tried to do within yep. the context is, as you point out, or as the Honourable Member points out, uh, is uh, within the context of, of uh, uh, you know, environment has uh, essentially kept its budgets relatively <coughs> stable. Uh, and uh, we do that uh, uh, because um, uh, we want to, you know, make sure that we're just moving priorities around internal to government and keeping that rate of growth in the overall government budget right. uh, 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 to within uh, uh, reasonable limits. Um, also, uh, uh, previous budgets in around 13, 14 uh, contain some of that disaster recovery uh, program uh, funds fun from the FETs. Uh, and it wouldn't have been just the floods, it also potentially was the slave light fire as well, depending. Right. So uh, you do mention a lot about, uh, you know, and I, I do think it's important as, as you, we move ahead on this file, uh, you know, certainly science is a key component, uh, understanding the science and understanding new technologies. And I think that's what we've seen when it comes to LED lighting. It's much cheaper to purchase that now. And so, you know, it's probably a bit easier for government to take on those tasks, certainly around EcoFit. Um, so when it comes to the science-based, uh, so uh, it, where, where does the ministry compile this information in science-based? Like I know with the species at risk, uh, it's actually a legislative body, the Accord for Protection of Species at Risk Canada, and so there's a group of people, scientists, universities that come together. So within your ministry, outside of that particular piece at species at risk, where is your ministry uh, compiling the science and, the, and, and getting the data so that we know that, uh, you, you know, respectfully that, that, that your initiatives are science-based, not, not steeped in kind of an ideology, uh, you know, kind of going it on your own. Um, and, and I'm just wondering if you could also tell me how many full-time positions occupy that part of your office to make sure that, you know, you know, they're compiling the science. We've kind of got, on wildlife policy, you've got two spots. We've got the Fish and Wildlife Branch, who are uh, uh, tasked with, of course, uh, we update the uh, uh, hunting regulations every year to reflect uh, what is actually happening on the landscape uh, in terms of wildlife counts of various kind in, the, in, in each individual wildlife management unit, and which is what, of course, then uh, uh, presages decisions on how many tags are issued, uh, 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 seasons, uh, uh, that kind of, those kinds of decisions. So that's, uh, that's in the Fish and Wildlife Branch. I'll let uh, a Deputy talk a little bit more about what goes on there. But the other piece uh, of it is the Environmental Monitoring and Science Division. And uh, uh, Honourable Member, you've just hit on one of the reasons why we brought the Monitoring and Science Division back into government was to ensure better coordination uh, between uh, uh, what is going on in the monitoring uh, uh, side, in particular in the oil sands region where we uh, have had a number of international reputation challenges and so on, uh, uh, so that that work is better feeding into how we make water, air, air land, uh, 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 fish and wildlife policy. Uh, and. Uh, uh, to have a little bit better integration there while maintaining the independence of the Science Advisory Panel and the, and the Office of the Chief Scientist. I would just add, add Minister for the Chair, I, I would say that um, the scientists are everywhere in the department. We have some in the policy section, we have some in the operations section, and some certainly a lot in the science and monitoring division. Uh, and that's important because we have to have scientists in the field as well. So for example, uh, the, the, wo the work that's being done on caribou, we have lots of scientists in the field doing that. The important piece to mention in addition to what the Minister said was that with the advent of the chief scientist now in the department, over the past uh, 10 months since he's been in the department, he's conducted a rationalization of the science throughout the department 
one, to make sure we've got the right scientists in the right positions, uh, two, to make sure we don't have overlap or, or scientists doing the same jobs in different, different places, uh, and three, making sure that it's the right scientific integrity that he's charged with providing based on the legislation that the government approved. And so what that means is Dr. Fred Rona is, is sort of going around rationalizing all this, making sure we've got the right scientists doing the right work. And scientists who were doing work previously are now uh, conforming to a, a standard in, that includes things like peer review uh, with, with other scientists in the country that we didn't have before. And so that's, that's really, um, you know, in terms of... <laughs> getting to the actual science of it, it really has reinforced uh, and strengthened that. And of course, the chief scientist is pre protected under the legislation to provide that scientific advice, <laughs> unfettered and uninfluenced, so. Right. So, so when it comes to the negative health effects of air pollution and mm -hmm. those sort of things and, and how uh, y your government has kind of tied that, uh, you know, to respiratory rates and whatnot, um, uh, with the performance measures, uh, how are you tracking those? Um, and uh, so are the performance measures being developed to evaluate the actual impact of coal pollution on health? And uh, what are you using as a, a baseline to, uh, you know, to determine that and the impact of shutting down coal-fired electricity plants? Sure. Uh, the uh, uh, analysis that uh, underlines the uh, 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 health effects of uh, coal pollution is the analysis that was uh, published by in, uh, Environment Canada uh, when the uh, uh, previous federal government uh, uh, introduced their coal regulations. Uh, a number of different uh, uh, organizations have, uh, uh, in conjunction with medical organizations, have updated uh, uh, that analysis since then. Um, and so uh, it, it was published, uh, it, was, well, it was gazetted, if you will, um, it, I, when those uh, uh, regulations were brought in by the uh, uh, previous federal government. Those are the, that's the analysis that shows the uh, uh, estimated health uh, uh, effects of, uh, uh, and the health costs in terms of the costs to our, uh, our uh, health care system. And so that's where that uh, uh, analysis uh, comes from. Now in terms of uh, ambient air quality standards, so we uh, uh, participate obviously at the FPT table uh, with the Canadian ambient air quality standards, uh, which are designed uh, to over time become more stringent as best technology becomes more economically achievable. And so uh, I, I, we uh, evaluate from our air monitoring stations, both point source and we have also funded uh, uh, some other non-point source uh, uh, activities over the last budget year uh, to get a better sense of uh, uh, how our uh, how we are measuring up to the CAKES standards and, and what our plan is as CAKES becomes, sorry, the Canadian Ambient Air Quality Standards, becomes more stringent over time. I, I think uh, it, it's fair to say that uh, uh, Alberta, uh, through monitoring, can, uh, uh, we have to make those investments and we have made those investments uh, and uh, uh, certainly through the approvals process as well as new uh, uh, projects uh, have to roll over their approvals so that we can uh, address some of these and, and we have a work plan to support that. So again, just kind of on that, uh, I know that uh, Deputy Minister, um, which by the way, I'm very fond of, uh, excellent uh, in helping me uh, during the floods. Uh, so good to see you. Um, uh, when it comes to who, who overrides the minister, is it always the scientist or can the minister override the scientist when it comes to initiatives? Uh, so on monitoring, uh, the science advisory panel reports to the public okay. uh, uh, in the law. Okay. And uh, uh, the Indigenous Wisdom uh, advisory panel, the minister must uh, appoint one as well. Uh, and uh, we did that uh, because, you know, there were, there were good things about the, uh, uh, the previous monitoring agency. Part of it was the, the independence. We wanted to retain that. But what we didn't want to retain was the extra layer of, you know, executive pay, uh, the extra administrative costs, those kinds of things. And so that's when we brought in Bill 18, the uh, uh, Monitoring Act last year. That was the balance that we sought to strike. Okay. So uh, speaking of the sci science, uh, I just want to move over to the, the Spring Bank Dam um, uh, around the environmental impact and assessment. Um, so obviously there's been lots of objections from the Sutina 
and other affected uh, communities. Uh, uh, can you uh, fill us in on, on the Spring Break Dry Dam and uh, whether that uh, environmental impact study has been completed or not? Uh, well, I think we need to be a little bit careful here, uh, Honourable Member, just because um, I, I, a number of, of assessments were done previous to government making uh, the decision that they were going to move forward with the project. And now Alberta Transportation has become the proponent of the project because it's a joint review uh, uh, panel. Uh, Environment and Parks essentially becomes the regulator in this case. Uh, and so we want to be uh, uh, careful uh, uh, about this in terms of uh, uh, how we uh, uh, proceed. I, I think uh, we can go over uh, all of the uh, pieces that our uh, uh, department undertook prior uh, to uh, taking the decision to move forward with this particular project, including uh, all of the uh, engagements with Sutina. We can undertake as a follow-up. I know that the information is public, but we can provide that uh, to you. Uh, I, I, you know, in taking the decision on moving forward with SR1 as opposed to uh, the other project, uh, 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 the environmental impacts were key to that decision. Um, the McLean Creek uh, project, as proposed, would have involved uh, quite a bit more lengthy environmental impact assessment work, given as it is in uh, grizzly bear uh, uh, habitat and uh, uh, some of our native trout species that we've now had orders on. So uh, uh, plus uh, the structure of it uh, uh, would have taken longer to construct and, ha and potentially had more uh, failure during construction risks associated with it. So that's why we took the uh, SR1 decision. Right. And so uh, can you give us status on the funding of the Spring Break Dam and specifically with regards to money set aside for the environmental impact studies, compensation for, uh, compensation for affected landowners? and uh, consult consultation with communities. Uh, I'll uh, uh, defer to the deputy for that. So there is, there is a line item uh, in the capital budget for Spring Bank, and it does, it does come out of the Environment and Parks uh, budget. We then give it to transportation to execute the project because they're the, the proponent. Um, and so it, it really is transportation who does the environmental impact assessment, who prepares everything in preparation for what will eventually be an NRCB hearing. And, and that's all transportation as the proponent. So uh, there is a one line item in it uh, that tells you how much is being spent on the overall project, but transportation really should speak to, to the other pieces. If, if I could just get back to the one question I didn't answer about the chief scientist, if that's okay. Sure. There is no overriding either way. The minister doesn't override the chief scientist, the chief scientist. Chief scientists can't override the minister. They, it doesn't work that way. Chief scientists provide scientific uh, evidence, advice, and consideration, and right. the minister considers it. So there is no overriding either way. Right. Okay. And the legislation wouldn't allow for it. So. Yeah. Good. Um, sorry. And then just the number on uh, Spring Bank, the estimate for 1718 uh, is uh, 35 million for this year, and of course it's a it's a three year. Uh, projection right now with 30, 35 million this coming year, 75 million, and then 25 million. Right. And so somewhere in that 35 million would be the funds to do the EIA right. uh, that transportation is doing. But right. we should ask them. So we've seen, we've seen some uh, obviously impacts uh, from floods and forest fires, but uh, quite honestly, I think we would all agree that uh, a major drought crisis is more likely to come upon us more than anything else. Can you, can you provide us uh, some uh, information on, you know, uh, protection around drought and uh, irrigation measures uh, that are being undertaken and uh, you know as they're outlined in your business plan specifically regards uh, for funding these projects so that uh, you know folks that face drought and we will likely face that before any other catastrophe that, that that's actually being uh, funded appropriately. Sure. Uh, I, I will uh, just uh, uh, speak to my colleague, Minister Carlier's estimates for a moment. I believe uh, uh, there is $19 million a year of investments in irrigation infrastructure, but uh, moving back over to environment and parks for a moment, uh, uh, that's where a number of these uh, uh, water infrastructure uh, investments play a dual role. Uh, in many uh, cases, in particular, the Watershed Restoration and Resilience Program hold water on the landscape. Uh, and uh, what that accomplishes is it means that uh, I, I, it, it is not just all washing through. That you, it, when you do that in the in the headwaters and elsewhere, you are ensuring that you've got uh, uh, streams fed through ground groundwater and so on. So uh, that uh, uh, is um, 
certainly part of the approach. It's certainly part of the approach as we examine a climate <coughs> adaptation framework that works for l rural uh, landowners, municipalities, uh, grazing leaseholders, <coughs> and others. Uh, and uh, uh, it is part of uh, uh, maintaining our water infrastructure uh, properly and, and certainly uh, some of the conversations around uh, the management of water in the bow uh, with uh, there's been a sort of multi-stakeholder process uh, uh, with Transalta and municipalities and others that it, it, and it's for both dual purpose uh, uh, for examining the drought implications and also the the flooding in the uh, aftermath of 213. Thank you very much Minister. We'll now move on to members of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Minister, deputies, uh, good morning. Uh, Minister, with regards to the $30 million being provided by the federal government on orphan wells and the cleanup, uh, can you provide uh, the committee uh, the details uh, on the mechanism of how that money is going to flow? Uh, unfortunately, honor Honourable Member, uh, uh, that uh, is uh, the Orphan Well uh, Association and Associated Programs are, are situated in the Department of Energy, okay. uh, not Environment and Parks. Okay. Um, now, do you expect at any point uh, your office will be asked to provide funding for the Orphan Well cleanup? Uh, uh, not yet, Honourable Member. I mean, part of the uh, uh, part of this work is. Uh, 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 our work as environment and parks and ensuring that uh, 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 we do some work with professional associations and so on to make sure that we know what the training requirements are and uh, uh, some of the compliance and, and, and that piece that sometimes involves uh, environment and parks. The, uh, uh, agrologists, for example, or and their role with respect to the, or uh, uh, who is uh, uh, able to uh, uh, certify that a, a wetland is in fact a wetland, for example, that involves environment and parks uh, on that regulatory uh, piece. Uh, but uh, so far, uh, 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 the conversations around uh, orphan well reclamation have uh, resided within the expertise of the Orphan Well Association and their relationship with the Department of Energy and the uh, Alberta Energy Regulator. There is a role for for uh, 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 some of the ongoing uh, uh, reporting and so on through environment and parks, and there's a role uh, uh, for us vis-a-vis -vis the Surface Rights Board uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the ensuring that landowners are, are treated fairly uh, uh, under that uh, piece of legislation. Um, but that's where uh, that's the, the scope of our role so far. Okay, so so at this point. Uh, you guys aren't f uh, fully integrated with that program in terms of the cleanup. Uh, I, I, no, um, I, I think w there's probably a few more technical details that uh, that I am not in possession of that I will ask the deputy minister to discuss. Thanks, minister and chair. Um, first, firstly, I would say that it is, as the minister said, a, an AER and energy program to run. We are very integrated in it because we provide policy advice on on some of the programs that they're they're doing, and of course, from the, from a regulatory perspective, we get involved. We also get involved in in the technical deliberations and making sure that you know we're saying the same things and doing following the same standards in the oil and gas sector and then the sectors that we regulate. Uh, so there's a lot of common uh, themes that we talk about from a technical perspective. And so I say we are, we are well integrated technically. And then finally on the training side, there are a lot of excellent uh, Indigenous and First Nations companies that, that are going to get into some of this uh, orphan well cleanup. And so we're working with them as well from a technical perspective So and, and helping and advising on training and things like that. So Right. And uh, again, just because you've touched on it, just the indigenous lands and uh, like, is, uh, are you aware of how many of these orphan wells uh, are on indigenous lands? And then second to that, um, how much, uh, I guess in your office, how, how integrated is indigenous issues uh, with the environment and traditional lands, that sort of thing? Is there a segment of your office? Are you expanding that? Where is that at now? Uh, great question. So I'll take the first one first, which is I believe that we do know where the orphaned and abandoned uh, in terms of the list. Uh, certainly the AER knows uh, uh, how many there are, so I, I imagine the geographic location is also uh, uh, known to them. Uh, and uh, I don't know if we can undertake an undertaking for them, uh, but uh, uh, perhaps Deputy, you have a bit more detail uh, on Minister that. Chair, I would, I would recommend sort of 
directly asking that question of the AER and the, and or the Orphan Well Association because they that's the direct yeah. method. Uh, on the Indigenous piece, uh, I, you know, there's no question that uh, this is a busy file uh, for us in environment and parks. Uh, and uh, it's more than a file. It's sort of a, uh, a way of thinking and uh, a way of approaching problem solving. Uh, and uh, so we're trying to integrate it into almost everything we do. For example, uh, a new... Um, uh, parks. Uh, we're uh, beginning some conversations uh, 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 on the subject of the wildland proposed wildland parks in the Lower Athabasca area, and if there's opportunities there for co-management. Uh, similarly, with uh, the Newcastle parks, uh, if there's opportunities for indigenous co-management there, we see co-management sort of prevailing in uh, a number of other jurisdictions, but we haven't really done it yet here. And so, uh, uh, you know, we're taking our time and doing it carefully. But I, I think that's one really interesting opportunity for economic development as well as ensuring you know our, our constitutional obligations around traditional land use are, are upheld so that's one uh, uh, piece of it. Uh, another piece is, for example, the work around the All Sands Advisory Group. Uh, we, uh, the uh, 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 co-chair uh, is uh, uh, an individual from the Miccosu Creek, uh, and uh, she uh, is, is uh, uh, very much involved uh, in that process, for example. Um, and uh, there are a number of other ways uh, in which we're trying to weave it into our work. Right. And so in terms of finance, uh, how much money do you receive from the federal government in partnership to ensure that those Indigenous issues are, are addressed, not just at a provincial level, but on a national level? Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I, I think that uh, uh, we could maybe uh, use a bit more help from the federal government on some of these land issue, our land use issues and ensuring that we uh, uh, are, are substantively addressing our constitutional obligations around traditional land use and our, our treaty uh, uh, responsibilities. You know, from our perspective, we're uh, trying to do what we can within the budgets that we have and looking for ways that we can uh, uh, create potentially new partnerships with the feds. I'm thinking here around oil sands monitoring, for example. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, our, we have taken the, the view that as a province, uh, we will do our part, uh, for example, in drinking water. And so the capital investments to bring, uh, uh, to do some of that uh, last mile or pr the provincial infrastructure piece, uh, and then uh, the on-reserve piece is, is up to the federal government. Right. Uh, so so you, you mentioned uh, the drinking water and uh, water stations, particularly on Indigenous lands. Uh, can, can you tell the committee how soon that work will start from a provincial level in, in addressing water quality uh, on reserve land? Uh, I believe the uh, uh, environment and parks has a bit of a role uh, in terms of uh, uh, like the actual transportation of the water and the water pipelines are of course up to Alberta transportation. Uh, but we do have uh, some of the uh, monitoring water quality and that kind of, of role. Uh, and I believe that work has already started in partnership with Alberta transportation. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, ask a deputy who used to be a transportation deputy uh, to provide a bit more detail there. Thanks, Minister Chair. Uh, just a couple things on, on the Indigenous pieces. Um, I just wanted to highlight that um, we're doing a whole bunch of training right now in the public service on Indigenous uh, work and liaison and partnerships. So that, that <coughs> there's an enhancing the public service Indigenous training on that. Uh, we've mentioned the Indigenous Wisdom Advisory Panel. We're doing a lot of work on co uh, parks cooperative management and regional planning and direct engagement with Indigenous nations on things like trapping and harvesting and all those things. We also uh, are at, at the department, we have two Indigenous interns right now and we're uh, running the next project over the next years to enhance that to a number of five. Uh, so just on the Indigenous pieces, with respect to um, the second question, which was drinking water, drinking water. Yes. So there is a deputy minister's uh, drinking water committee, indigenous drinking waters committee that has been stood up and we've uh, had over the last six months and we're working on strategies that includes uh, the federal government at the table. Uh, and the key piece that we want to do from, from a drinking water perspective is make sure that our provincial and municipal connections, uh, we, we essentially take them to, and make them easier to take to indigenous first nations, uh, essentially, you know, provide that, that resource. So as we do uh, Water for Life projects, we're always thinking, okay, how can we most easily connect the Indigenous First Nation that is closest to that? Right. And and we're getting priorities from that from the federal government as well as Indigenous nations themselves. So. Okay. Uh, can, can you tell me how many Indigenous uh, full-time staff are embedded in your office to work on these files day to day? I can't. Uh, in terms of the uh, department? 
Yeah. I I don't know if we I don't know if we would even gather that anyway. Uh, or at very <laughs> least, like in a leadership position to, that's an ongoing advisor you know, to deputy ministers and, and up. So, uh, Minister Chair, I believe that's a question for the Public Service Commissioner because I don't believe at this point that we uh, the, the the bureaucracy tracks. Um, um, gen uh, not not gender, but um, ethnicity. ethnicity yeah. No, I just I just uh, thought yeah. just you know you know uh, quality quality of water, uh, dealing with land issues, mm -hmm. reclamation of land, and that sort of thing. I just thought it, it, it might be a line item that uh, you'd be aware of. Um, uh, Minister, can you uh, can you give us? Uh, you know what? I'm going to save my question uh, coming up here. So, Chair, we'll, we'll move on because I think my time is almost up. We'll now move on to members of the third party once again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Minister, uh, can, you, can you tell us whether or not uh, cost-benefit analysis will be part of uh, green funding of certain, as you would put it, package of proposals? I, 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 yes. I, I, I think uh, uh, near-term greenhouse gas emissions reductions are, are at the forefront of the investment of, the, uh, uh, of these dollars, whether that's uh, uh, working with our partners in the private sector or in uh, 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 the uh, 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 GOA-related infrastructure or um, uh, sort of quasi-government uh, infrastructure in the municipalities, university schools, hosts, and sort of mush sector. Right, and so, so who administers that? Uh, who who will actually be? Uh, is, is that an in-house task, or is it you know, or is it is it sent out of house so that uh, Albertans can be sure they're getting good value for their money? When, you know, when when you're subsidizing certain projects. Sure, uh, uh, good question. So it really depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about municipalities right now, the current uh, investments in uh, uh, energy retrofits and uh, municipal uh, PV is being uh, uh, administered jointly. So we fund it, it and AUMA and AMDC fund it a little bit uh, as well. It's called the MCCAC. And they have a set of uh, uh, criteria that they, uh, they use in terms of GHG abatement and cost and, and, and bridging some of those gaps and... and uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of priority investments to make in terms of uh, uh, realizing savings for municipal tax taxpayers. So that's that program. Going forward to uh, the additions that we've made to that uh, for uh, on-farm solar PV and on-farm efficiency, those are, are uh, done by the uh, 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 the folks that are already administering the, the existing Growing Forward 2 program, which is over in agriculture and forestry. Uh, and uh, uh, if there are specific projects, such as uh, uh, an upgrade to Mount Royal uh, University I think there was some heating and cooling upgrades happening there. Uh, uh, those are, are based on uh, 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 essentially uh, is the project happening anyway, but uh, do we need to bridge a gap to a, a significantly more efficient way uh, to uh, undertake, you know, either HVAC or, 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 or whatever uh, the, the situation is? Uh, and is it a project that's moving along? And is, is, the, is the greenhouse gas emissions reduction uh, 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 measurable and reportable and verifiable? Okay. Now, in terms of who has the final say on whether a project goes forward or not, is there a process that you work through within your government uh, that eventually makes its way to cabinet? So mm -hmm. essentially, who has the final say on whether projects go forward or not? Uh, there is a, a, a cabinet process, uh, certainly, uh, uh, but again, it, it ma uh, uh, the uh, uh, determination of whether something uh, uh, gets funding under these early stage programs it, uh, it re relates back to what kind of program it is, whether it's a municipality or whether it's a uh, 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 government uh, 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 taking care of its own infrastructure or uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, some of the programs for nonprofits or, or others. Uh, as we move uh, towards standing up the Energy Efficiency Agency, uh, a lot of that uh, expertise and, and evaluation and criteria will be uh, uh, housed within that Energy Efficiency Agency, which is the, the kinds of programs that uh, you know, ordinary people might avail themselves of, or nonprofits, or or uh, small business, and uh, that's how it is. Uh, energy efficiency programs are delivered uh, in other jurisdictions, and and uh, uh, we're following you know the advice of the energy efficiency expert panel on that. Uh, in terms of what programs come first, second, third, uh, and also what the uh, the performance metrics are. Right. So, uh, in terms of, and I know that you're at the Paris Climate Change Summit. Um, from uh, kind of, it's a two two prong question. From a political perspective, what's politically sustainable uh, to encourage green investment and regular investment in the province when when you're coming up with policies around uh, green initiatives, 
and then also economically sustainable. Uh, is there is there a place in the world that you look to to form these policies? Uh, you know, i.e., you know, best practices uh, to implement here in Alberta, or do you, or is it a catchment of areas and you try to pick the best? Like, how, how do you how do you get to those points? Um, uh, and hopefully, you can answer that. Well, certainly around energy efficiency, there are lots of jurisdictions to look to in the industrialized world, given that Alberta is the only place in North America without an efficiency strategy. And so there are lots of lessons learned and, and uh, so on. As for uh, 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 the larger uh, 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 industry uh, questions, I, I, I think it's, it's quite difficult, actually, to uh, draw comparisons between Alberta and uh, uh, other places just because we are such an export-based uh, uh, economy, as we discussed. You can uh, uh, learn a, a, a great deal from uh, talking to other jurisdictions, which is uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, I go uh, on these trips, even though uh, everyone who knows me knows I don't like to travel away from my kids. I, but uh, um, you learn a lot when you, when you engage with uh, uh, other jurisdictions at that uh, we have joined the compact of states and regions and that uh, that table is uh, a number of subject national jurisdictions uh, from all over the world uh, and uh, uh, around uh, efficiency adaptation industrial policy uh, uh, coverage of carbon pricing all of the, those things there's just a, so many different things happening out there in the world that I think it's important for us to uh, to learn from that and and certainly the efficiency expert panel also did a number of interjurisdictional comparisons so it's not just me it's the uh, 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 experts that we have asked to to deliberate on these matters have also done a lot of that comparison right <clears throat> kind of again in that same vein uh, under your uh, in your business plan on page 69, it, uh, in the economic diversification piece uh, and performance measures, um, uh, the key strategy uh, 2.2 mentions jobs from the green technology. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any corresponding performance measures to track your progress there. Why is that? Yeah, you know, I think that's a fair point, and uh, and I think as we move forward with uh, I, uh, some of the. Um, expansion or deliberating on how we might expand the innovation and technology uh, space for, for Alberta and for Alberta companies, uh, uh, looking at ways that the uh, emissions reduction in Alberta, the old CCEMC, uh, uh, can uh, expand its work. Uh, the role of Alberta Innovates, uh, now that uh, Minister Billis has uh, uh, amalgamated the various uh, uh, organizations into one and uh, uh, had some restructuring there. At that point, I think that we will be uh, uh, sort of ready to uh, uh, put forward some performance measures on that. Certainly, in re emissions reduction in Alberta, uh, in their business plan and in their annual reports, uh, uh, does do quite a bit of uh, uh, reporting on uh, the number of projects they fund and the outcomes from those projects, whether right. it's GHG abated, uh, 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 technologies created, and so on. Right, and so again, just kind of on the you know cost benefit analysis and that sort of thing, you know what studies have been done, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know to track the impact of real jobs versus expected jobs, and, and I guess for example, if you look at you know the new technology around wind farms, uh, they're much taller, uh, they're much more efficient comparatively to the ones uh, you know that are now being taken down by certain companies. Uh, so they will require less technicians. Is that you know? Is there some foresight to that? As the technology gets better, you less likely need more people to operate them. Well, uh, uh, certainly in uh, uh, wind energy, there are uh, cer uh, certainly technology changes, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there are also technology changes uh, around um, being able to monitor what the turbines are doing and who is. Uh, uh, and there's, it's a high level of expertise uh, in that. Uh, toward some of the. Uh, uh, technology that they used to do that uh, uh, with uh, GE, and those are uh, uh, very high-skilled uh, uh, jobs in terms of the uh, uh, monitoring of, of what's going on out there on the, the landscape. I, I think it's also fair to say that uh, uh, certainly there are uh, uh, lo there's lots of work in the development of uh, 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 wind energy uh, across the province and in the uh, revenue base uh, for landowners. Uh, and uh, ability for farmers to uh, uh, to make the uh, to make the economics work and uh, 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 to uh, sustain those those rural communities uh, and, and we've seen that in Vulcan and Carbon Gay uh, in Wheatland County elsewhere. Um, th there's far more than just wind. 
uh, yeah. out there. There's uh, uh, certainly there's lots of, of uh, interesting and exciting activity happening in methane abatement. Yeah. Uh, that's an area where uh, Alberta has undertaken pretty ambitious uh, reduction targets, and there's lots of companies out there right now uh, uh, deploying new leak detection and repair technology uh, and uh, uh, putting oil and gas workers right. to work, which is exciting. So w would it be fair to say uh, that in the future we may be able to see in a line item or part of the business plan you know, some sort of tracking of the amount of jobs and how they're related to certain green technologies, uh, again, to report back to Albertans that, you know, your policies and your initiatives are, are working or aren't working so that you can, you know, make changes and, and, and adapt. I, I, you know, I think that's really uh, a fair comment and a, a fair undertaking for us uh, as a climate change office and uh, 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 potentially... Um, you know, I'll uh, go around uh, uh, committing other ministers to work, but uh, potentially I, I, uh, through the uh, Department of uh, Economic Development uh, as well. We've already seen, uh, for example, Calgary Economic Development put out a report very recently around the uh, economic impact of uh, green energy uh, and uh, efficiency uh, in that city, uh, and they've also projected some growth there. Thanks, Minister. We'll now uh, continue with our rotation and move on to members of the third party. Chair. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about the Climate Change Innovation Task Team. Um, I just wonder if you can provide us some details of the composition of that and uh, who's going to be leading the team and uh, you know, who's going to be asked to join the team. Sure. Uh, so uh, I just want to make sure I'm clear on uh, which task team we're talking about. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> yeah, the climate change innovation. Yeah. So uh, Gord Lambert uh, uh, chaired that uh, uh, innovation task force. Uh, he was on the Leach panel uh, as well. He's previously uh, his previous experience was with uh, uh, Suncor and Transalta, other uh, uh, members of that uh, task force. And now I'm going to make sure that I get it right. Uh, I, I I know that Sarah Hastings Simon served uh, on that, and I believe Judy Fair and did uh, as well. She's the chair of the Alberta Innovates Board, but also she's with Synovus and, and uh, 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 really has a deep understanding of this uh, 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 space in general. Uh, there could have been other uh, uh, participate, and, and so you're going to have to forgive me. I will get you that list, uh, honorable member. Uh, but uh, uh, so they have done some consultation uh, and uh, uh, they will be providing uh, a report uh, uh, to government and, and government will uh, consider it just as we have with our other expert panels and, and so on. I, I think there's also a process underway wh whereby uh, the OSAN's advisory group is uh, examining these, these items, not just in, uh, uh, and so more focusing on obviously uh, 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 what kind of partnerships we can undertake with industry via COSIA or other um, uh, uh, bodies uh, to reduce the, the GHG per barrel. Uh, in oil sands production. Of course, the innovation task team, uh, the task force uh, chaired by, uh, by Gord Lambert was looking at it a little bit more broadly than just the oil sands. So there's uh, a couple of different uh, considerations happening in this space. Right. I, just want, I want to move to uh, the Alberta Emergency Management Agency and the Provincial Operations Centre. It's on page 47 mm -hmm. of your fiscal plan. Uh, I don't believe there's any money allotted this year, but there's uh, uh, some money's going in next year and the following years after that. Um, uh, I just, can you give us some details on that new command center? Uh, essentially, where will it be built? What's the anticipated cost? And uh, what kind of feedback are you getting from first responders and the past two disasters of how to really make uh, the most of that building so it, you know, to better serve Albertans? Uh, I, I believe that that uh, uh, capital project is being led by Municipal Affairs, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I do know, however, though, that uh, the, uh, the POC, uh, as it is referred to, uh, uh, is, uh, 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 was not, could, could not really sustain the level of activity that we saw within it uh, uh, during the response to the Fort McMurray wildfire, and I'm sure that was the case in, the, in 2013 as well. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, at some point, uh, one must invest in that infrastructure to be able to uh, uh, accommodate the large numbers of first responders and, and others. Certainly the City of Calgary uh, has a new uh, uh, operations centre uh, that I had the opportunity to tour last year, uh, and uh, it, it has the ability to respond to disasters uh, that we did not 
really see at the uh, uh, in terms of actual being able to house uh, uh, people from uh, various uh, <laughs> places and ha having work sp uh, space for everyone and to have everything coordinated properly. So I think it's a wise investment given uh, uh, how I saw the the, the existing POC uh, right. uh, operate and everyone made a uh, you know the best of a you know uh, mediocre situation. Uh, I, I think in terms of those um, uh, uh, infrastructure supports and uh, uh, certainly we uh, it didn't take away from the overall response effort. But uh, I think it's also fair to say that we need to invest there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so, again, just kind of around, uh, I guess the question is, is uh, why you guys would be investing in that over the next three years in terms of your estimates? I think we have to ask which line you're referring to. I think, I, I think uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, what, sorry, where is it again? Uh, I think it might just be in the yeah, overall capital plan. page 47 of, uh, of the fiscal plan. Yeah, the fiscal plan. And it's just at the bottom there. It talks about the Provincial Operations Center. 47, fiscal plan, under capital plan details. Yeah, it's under it public safety emergency services. That's yeah. MA's budget. Yeah, uh, so that piece would be under the uh, uh, under MA's budget. Okay. Public safety and emergency services under 47. Yeah. So we, uh, and that's why we didn't see the Kananaskis Emergency Services okay. Center in our budget. Because uh, okay. it's over there. Okay, very good. Yeah. Thanks. I'm all, I'm all done, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Minister Deputies.